okay uh, so welcome back everyone uh, so in the last lecture uh, i essentially uh, tried to give you a realization of this uh, butterfly effect in the black hole geometry and uh, at least intuitively we saw that uh, black holes are chaotic i mean a uh, small but early perturbation can drastically change the future evolution of the system okay so in this lecture, essentially we'll derive this uh, Lyapunov uh, exponent associated with this black hole geometries. And we'll show that uh, this saturates the bound that uh, so we proposed. So the way we do it is as follows. Okay, so essentially we'll compute this OTOC. So now I'm considering a generic time model. So we'll essentially compute this OTOC in the bulk using holography. Okay. And the first thing, first step is to think of this OTOC as the overlap of these two states. Okay. Where this psi1 is so d t3 w t4 dft. And psi2 is some w t2 v t1. So these are states in the boundary, but we uh, will realize them in the bulk, okay. So now these are in the bulk, these are like two particle states. Okay, so let's call this, this one say in state, out state. So essentially what we're trying to do, we're trying to visualize this OTOC as a two, two scattering in the bulk, okay. Now, uh, here is a small subtlety. So particularly we are interested in the time ordering, like T1 is equal to T3, T2 is equal to T4, and uh, say my T2 is much, much greater than T1. Okay, so the V operators are at same instance, the W operators are other instant, but this is out of time ordered by this choice. Okay. So under this kind of ordering, what happens is that, this in-state and out-state, they do not look like exact in-state and out-state because in typical scattering, the in-states, the particle in the in-state are both are at say minus infinity and those at the, I mean, uh, in the out-state are at plus infinity. But here we can see that the, even for the in-state and the out-state, the particles are at different time slices, okay? So first what we'll do, we'll try to make it look like an exact in-state and out-state and this can be easily done in the, using the black hole geometry. So, so in the bulk, essentially, you have two slices. So, so this upper one, say, this is like a T4 of T2, and the lower one, say, T3 says T2. So now for the in state, we can see the first there's a W operator. So the W operator acts somewhere here. Okay. So you can realize this quanta anywhere on this slice. Okay. Whereas the T, the V quanta acts on an early time. Okay. So to prepare the state, what we'll do, we essentially take this state, take this quanta W quanta and it will evolve it backward in time on this slice. Now see the, since we are working with this HR minus HL kind of prescription, I mean the thermophile double state is actually invariant under time translation, okay. So in the bulk, every time slice is exactly I mean, identical. Okay. So we'll essentially take this state and evolve it backwards in time to realize on this early state. And in, on this state, we'll now add this V quanta. So this is, for example, my instinct. They'll essentially come together and collide in this region. Okay. Similarly, for the out state, the V quanta is in some early slice, whereas this uh, W quanta is in some late slice. Okay. So for the out state, what we'll do, we'll take the earlier quanta and uh, forward and take it forward in time, and then we'll add this W quanta. So W V V W. 
Okay, so this is like my in state and this is my out state. So we want to find out that what is my amplitude that after this collision here, that this W particle will end up at this point. Okay. So this out state explicitly has this particle W quanta at this T size. Here we are not sure that if it ends up here or not. So we'll see what is the probability. I mean, had black hole been a non-chaotic system, we know this probability have been one, okay. but here we are not sure. So essentially this is the computation that we have to do in the bulk. Okay. Now for that, we have to express the states in the bulk. Okay. So that's like a deriving the working problem. So first, these are essentially two particle states, but let's start off with say simple one particle state. So here we are actually introducing the time uh, space. Uh, we'll need that at some point as well. So what you do, So on the boundary, you're hitting with this operator and you're creating an excitation on the boundary okay, at some time. Okay. Now we can realize this excitation at any point in the bulb using the bulk to boundary propagator. Okay. This is a bulk to boundary means function. So we can write this WXT as some, we'll be using crucial coordinates in the bulb. This phi field is actually dual to the uh, this operator, and the then the, the weekly lines that we are drawing are essentially quanta of this phi field. Okay. So now essentially we can actually uh, sum over. I mean, we can essentially expand this state. We can essentially uh, sum over all such u VMX. So from my capital, it's my, is my transverse direction. I mean, the x direction, the bulk as for the boundary x direction, I'll use small x. I mean, that's just to avoid confusion, uh, nothing else. Okay. So now essentially I can realize the quanta anywhere in the bulk. Okay. Now in our picture, this W quanta travels along this. Uh, so this is my V direction. My u direction. It travels along this v direction. However, uh, the, we know the region of interest is particularly this. Okay, so we want to realize this quanta in this v equal to zero slice, delocalized along this u axis. Okay. For that, what we'll do? We'll simply put take this uh, look at this means function other way at v equal to zero. So this now kills this integral and stuff. That's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, since we are interested in a scattering kind of picture, it's always instructive to expand not in position basis, but in momentum basis. That is a basis which consists of longitudinal momentum and transverse position. Okay? Because that helps us to define this Mandelstam variable S or the impact parameter. So at this point, what we'll do, we'll do a Fourier transform. Okay. So for that, we need the metric of this geometry. So the metric is we are working uh, in this uh, crucial coordinates. So the metric is something like this. So I need to suppose the horizon radius. Squared. Okay. We'll uh, symbolically write it as something which is function. And for quantities near this bifurcation region, we'll simply call the A0, similarly R0. Okay. So with this matrix, now we can easily Fourier transform this, the state. So this will be something like that V. Right. 
And this we can write as shy of okay. So where the shy is nothing but the Fourier transform of this uh, bulk to boundary propagator. So this is my formula for shy. Okay. So now. Okay, sorry, I should write this as WST, everything on TFD. Sorry. Okay, so this is how we expand my one particle state in the bulk in the uh, momentum basis. So this, this is the longitudinal momentum and this is the transverse position. Okay. Now we can generalize these two, these two particle states. So remember that this V particle, sorry, V particle travels along the U axis because the W particle travels along the V axis. So essentially uh, we can do this uh, in a similar way. So there you have these two wave functions and this two particle states, this is like a tensor product of one particle states. Okay. So essentially now the overlap boils down to this. This is this product of these wave functions. Here we have taken actually a dagger. The reason is because, so in this formula, finally when you compute this, the psi is actually know the location of this uh, time, I mean, okay. And essentially what we're gonna do, we are gonna uh, analytically continue this time, so, okay. So uh, in that case, we'll get T star and so on. So put, even though you are working with Hermitian operators, I have just kept this dagger explicitly. Okay. So this is roughly our working formula. Now, obviously uh, this, uh, I mean, in general, it's hard to work it out in a black hole background. So what we'll do, we are gonna make some approximations. Yeah, so there's a question. Uh, hello. Yes. In the earlier integral form uh, that was in the momentum space, right? So uh, here I missed. Uh, how do you know that which is time order or out of order? This I missed. Sorry, yes. which one? Uh, in the OTOC where you have the momentum space integral. Uh, I think the last. Left is my time ordering here, Andy. So this is my time ordering prescription for these operators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, then what I'm doing is so now what I'm doing just uh, to view this as a two to scattering, I'm actually realizing this point at some same slice. Okay. This just looks like a typical in state and typical. Both are a okay, set. Okay. okay. So that's one thing we have done here. Okay. But finally, yeah. in my final formula, when I essentially compute this, uh, I, I'll fix this uh, time again. Okay, to get the results. There we'll explicitly use this uh, relative time ordering. Okay, so it doesn't depend on which ones you take star and which ones you don't, means like, uh, for example, uh, uh, amplitude where it is like psi three star, psi one, will it be like different time ordering? No, no, the stars are essentially coming because this goes to the kit, right? Uh, yes, 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 oh, okay. I mean, my, my formula is like this. So this will I take the dagger. Okay. Okay. So there, this shy comes from there. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, so okay. taking the dagger. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, so at this point, I mean, we have to make some approximations. And the approximation is, I, I, I roughly said this yesterday. So we'll work in the regime where this incoming momenta, PU3, EV4 are all large. So I, I roughly discussed how we produce uh, such large moment in a black hole background. And here actually I will show it. So so suppose this is my t equal to zero slice. And so this is my 
T3 slice or T1 slice, and so this is my T4 slice. Like, now this, let us write this main geometry first in a BTZ coordinate. Okay. Now, we understand near horizon physics. So near the horizon, this matrix looks is a Rindler field. So that this Rindler time is related to this BTZ time. If you work out this quarter transformation, you will see that this is the relation. Now this BTZ time is also my time in the boundary. So now what happens, so now T translation is like a eta translation. And we know what Rindler time translation is, it's nothing but a Lorentz boost. In the near horizon region. Okay. So that's the first thing. And the second point is that a Lorentz boost acts on null coordinates like scaling. So are you with me on this? I mean, maybe, okay, it's actually very easy to see. Just consider a simple boost. I mean, uh, say a boost of sine hyperbolic beta. Say the boost parameter is beta. So this is sine hyperbolic beta uh, t plus cos hyperbolic beta. Okay. Now, if you look at null coordinates, this will simply be to the power beta. Okay. So the statement is that uh, boundary time translation. by mod t is equal to the boost. So here it's a learning, I mean, a real time translation by two pi over beta t. So it's a boost with parameter e to the power two pi over beta mod t. Okay. So the longer you transfer on the boundary, the more the particles are boosted. So essentially here we are working with this large t3 and t4 all are large, okay. So t3, t4. Are all large. Hence, when the so these particles are heavily boosted, so when they meet at this uh, t equal to zero slice, they're heavily boosted particles. Okay. So now, the large momentum essentially implies a very short time of interaction so the longitudinal momentum and the transverse position are approximately conserved sorry Okay, so what it says is that, so in, in the picture that we are doing it, so, so this is like my uh, P3, P, PU3, this is my PU1, this is PU2, this is my PU4. So what it says is that the momentum conservation approximately holds. I mean. So what it's saying is that this PU1, will have most of the contribution from PU3 and uh, this PV2 will have it from PV4. So the transverse, I mean, the shift in the momentum in the orthogonal direction is very more small for such a collision for of such highly boosted particles. Okay. And here essentially this P1U, P2V, P3U, P4V are all infinite. Whereas this other components like P1V, P2U, P3D, P4U, the next to zero. Okay. So if you now compute the S channel momentum, 
this is roughly near at, at the point of collision. This is roughly like uh, P1 U, uh, sorry, P3 U, P4 U. And since both are large, this actually goes to infinity. Whereas the T channel momentum, this now becomes, sorry, I should, uh, yeah, that's fine. This is not what I'm doing. Yeah, that's fine. P1 U, P3 V plus P1 V, P3 U. And here, one of them is surely small, either P1 V is small or P3 V is small. So this roughly goes to zero. That is to say the S over T actually goes to, uh, sorry, infinity. So this is what is known as this iconal approximation. This name actually comes from the uh, optics uh, uh, where essentially this limit is like a limit to go from wave optics to uh, geometrical optics. So the limit is like lambda going to zero, which is here like this P going to infinity. So what's saying is that instead of thinking of them as some uh, delocalized uh, wave functions, we can actually think of them as some classical ray. Right. This is what this approximation is saying. And also this, since the uh, transverse uh, coordinates are approximately conserved, so we can write now uh, x1 is roughly equal to x3, x2 is roughly equal to x4. So why is this approximation uh, required? Because, I mean, it simplifies because under this kind of kinematics, what happens is that the in-state which is known like P3 U X3, P4 X4, it only offer, uh, suffers a shift of phase. I, see, I mean, suffers by a phase shift. So we call it names. This is a function of this uh, Mandelstam variable S and the impact parameter X3 minus X4. So we can write this state as. So are you fine at this point? Okay, so uh, then uh, if we put this now back to our work formula, then what we get is, right. Okay, so first we have to put this back to the formula and then uh, Essentially, we have to do a basis uh, normalization, this two particle basis normalization, which ultimately gives us this comes from. I'll show what is the normalization is. This comes from the normalization. So now we have like P1, P2, V, P1, P2, Psi1 star. Psi two star x two psi three psi four and delta six one minus x two. Okay, so what the normalization that we use is some p u for the one particle state is like this p u comma Q U comma Y sine naught square over four pi. So if you use this normalization here, then uh, essentially these two integrals of this three uh, P three and P four they essentially go away. And okay, so I have put I must put a factor of P U here, so then that gives these two factors of P. Okay. So ultimately with this iconal approximation, now it boils down to two parts. One, we have to compute this phase shift and the other is this wave functions. Okay. So the heart of the computation actually lies in computing this phase shift. I mean, all the physics of this scattering and all actually goes into this computation. 
but this uh, size are actually i mean more or less uh, trivial i mean there's not much physics in it okay. so we'll spend most of our time uh, understanding how to compute this phase shift delta okay. so first thing to note is that due to this iconal uh, approximation which results in this exponentiation of this phase so now this otoc looks like a bulk path integral Right, uh, because it's like some uh, five, 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 coming to the power, some that's kind of thing. Okay, in the bulk. Okay, so under this iconal approximation, the first thing is to identify this phase with the on shell action. This happens only uh, only when this actually this uh, S and B dependence exponentiate. You guess this factor. Otherwise, you cannot do this. Okay, so that's one uh, consequence of this iconal approximation. So what is this on shell action now? So my action is here, we are considering gravity and some matter field. I mean the matter which is dual to this operator. So this is like square root g r minus two lambda plus sum over i del phi x square square phi is square and so square root g. So now I'll discuss uh, two limits. Limit one is when the particles in the bulb, they do not interact. Okay. Matter do not interact. That is like saying your G Newton is zero. That is because at the level of this action, there is no coupling between the two fields. Okay, so they only interact through gravity, gravitational back reaction. So by letting them not to interact is like setting, I mean, ignoring the gravitational back reaction or setting this G Newton to zero. Then we know how to solve this. So essentially, we look for a saddle up. So in my Einstein's equation, these are like probe which will ignore. So there is no right hand side in the Einstein's equation. So you can solve this in three dimension and you can choose your favorite saddle. So here we choose it to be BTZ. And then on this BTZ background, you can essentially compute this matter action and solve equation of motion and go on shell. So in this limit, this essentially turns out to be some constant. It has no dynamical. See, ultimately we are interested in uh, doing some Sorry, where is it? Yes. Some OK, also there is some integral over this transfer space. So ultimately we're interested in doing some momentum integral and all. Okay, but here it's just a constant. It does not. I showed you that this actually leads to this for this delta equals to constant. There is actually no chaos. So when the two particles do not interact. Okay. The next thing is to consider. The, let the matter interact. Which is like taking G Newton small, but finite. So as I said, they interact only from back reactions. So one matter actually back reacts on the geometry and the other matter senses the graviton and vice versa. So when you take this back reaction, now your G0 goes to G0 plus some H. So now you linearize this action now. This is constant pieces. Plus now the new pieces actually form. Linearization, this is like some new matter. Okay. Now we have to essentially solve this uh, equation and go on shell. And the solution is very easy. It's nothing but linearized Einstein's equation. That mu nu plus two eight by g t mu nu. So when you put it back here, the reaction essentially becomes. I'm I'm ignoring these constant pieces, h mu nu. And if if you write in on this this background geometry, this essentially becomes some h 
square into mu dvv sage freedom. Okay. So the, roughly the picture is something like this. So your, this is your W particle, this is your V particle. One emits a graviton, the other couples with it, and vice versa. Okay. So this is the interaction that we are looking at. So now we have to compute this uh, HUU and HVV to compute this delta. Now for arbitrary curve background is actually a difficult computation, but uh, for the kind of kinematics we are in where we are essentially treating the sharply focused uh, particles traveling along this U and V direction, this actually uh, worked out by Dre and Hoof. So let's let's first uh, work out the case for uh, By the way, I should pause if there is any question or first one. Akhil, you can go ahead. Hi, this uh, ki this kinematics you discussed, like uh, in the naive diagram wise, uh, what what's the statement? Which diagram dominates is the statement? Okay, so we can go back. Well, uh, yeah, it's roughly this statement. See, uh, we are essentially okay. Let me actually go to this. Yeah, so the first statement was like uh, under this uh, approximation, this uh, we, I mean, just, sorry, this one. Okay. Yeah, so the first statement was this under this exponent, I mean, this approximation, uh, we have this exponentiation, that's the first thing. The second thing is that, uh, okay, yeah, now that's actually a good question. So see, we are working in the regime where we are setting this S to infinity, okay. And uh, this G Newton to zero, so is that this S times this G Newton, this actually is finite. Okay. Actually, you can consider the whole tower of this ladder diagrams, okay. But the dominant contribution will come from this term. Okay, so so the, to answer your question, this limit is like restricting this expansion in this age uh, to all the ladder diagrams, but ultimately uh, we are going to take this genu. I mean, we'll go to a regime final in the final step where essentially this uh, graviton exchange diagram will dominate. So this is actually uh, very similar to what Sobi was discussing. So he was discussing this identity block and this all this. Uh, so the first descendant was the stress tensor, right? So the in the boundary, the stress tensor uh, exchange is like this graviton exchange in the boundary. Then there is this descendant, which are like these uh, ladder diagrams, but uh, ultimately we work in the region where this stress tensor, uh, I mean, this graviton exchange will dominate. Otherwise you can consider the whole uh, with the ladder diagrams and so on. So, so is, uh, is this like the X channel, like the first uh, simplest form, is it like X channel or is it like the T channel? I'm confused. T channel, this is like T channel. And and that's the same diagram which uh, which decides this reggae growth and so on, is it? I want to see. Sorry, that's the same diagram. Uh, when these uh, when these uh, when she does Shubhamandal talk about uh, the some flat space analog of this, like they talk about the reggae growth, right? So is the, is the T channel diagram the leading thing in the reggae growth analysis? Uh, and maybe I'm asking for for the general audience. I too. think so. I think I, okay. this is okay. some iconal approximation, right? Yes. Yeah, that is better. Okay, thanks. Is there some other question? Yeah, so uh, means here you're taking S to infinity, right? P was tending to zero, so it should be S channel dominated. No, but we also showed that P goes to zero, right? I mean, in yeah, so. Oh, so whichever limit goes to zero will dominate. Well, what I'm saying is that this particle, that particle that's been exchanged are soft particles. I mean, the momentum is this, uh, I mean, yeah, I'm talking essentially talking about, uh, all right, okay, let me see. Yeah, I'm talking about, yeah. So these are my, like my instant, this is the out state. So essentially I'm talking about T channel exchange. 
So for example, these are these two are like main state and these two are like the out state. Since the uh, amplitude probably goes as one over t, that's why. Sorry. Is the amplitude like there is probably a pole for t which is one over t kind of that's why kind of this happens. So I'm just trying to understand why the t channel will dominate you know, from this limit. Okay, so uh, uh, let me actually arrive to my final formula. I mean that will be essentially in terms of the G Newton times s. Okay. 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 Uh, so I mean, s going to infinity and t going to zero are roughly the same thing in this picture. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Okay. Because oh, okay, of, okay. I think I showed this before. Uh, okay. Okay. So where did I write down this? Yeah. So this actually goes to zero. This goes to infinity. So yeah, one over t and t. This is the same thing. So, is there another question? Akhil is still raised hand. So, want to ask something? Uh, sorry, I forgot to talk about it. Okay, fine. Okay. So, here we need to find out this. Sorry. Oh, yeah. So we need to find out this HU and HVV. And uh, so for the kind of kinematics we're interested with, this, uh, this particles are like sharp rays and sharply localized uh, along, this, uh, along this V and this X direction. So then we can approximate this uh, matter stress tensor. So let's first consider the effect of this uh, V particle. So the V particle moves along this U direction. So we can uh, we can write this under this iconal approximation. We can write this stress tensor in the following way. There's some normalization I mean, which technically does not matter. So this is like some one. So this is sharply localized along this V direction, and also we choose it to be sharply localized in the transverse direction as well. So here I'm using the fact that my P3 is actually P1 and X3 is X1. So I'm already working with this. So now if you put this object in the uh, in Einstein's equation, then the, for example, so here, see this P1U, it essentially has the strength of the shock this actually has these factors of e to the power two pi beta times t one whatever. So now here, if you see this t mu nu, it has this factor e to the power two pi beta times t, and this g newton, this actually gives rise to this t star. So when this t one is roughly of the order of t star, this object essentially will become one, and we'll have to take into account this back reaction. That's what we are doing. So if you solve for this, then the resulting geometry is something like the that this HVV is completely determined by this stress tensor, and that is given by. And this F essentially satisfies some differential equation. This some constant. This doesn't come from this. Uh, I mean, you can choose arbitrary profile here, but uh, I mean, this is a good approximation. To assume that to be sharply localized along the transverse direction as well. Now, this equation as a solution for large x will essentially be interested in large impact parameter. So for large x, this equation has this following solution e to the power minus e times minus. So this is this geometry is the shock wave geometry. 
uh, we know. I mean, and just to relate to this uh, shift picture, I think this uh, what Akhil was probably asking that. Uh, so, so how do we know that this uh, this corresponds to shift in the geodesics when it crosses the shop? So this actually the picture that I went to. I, I saw yesterday is like, so when the shock falls into the black hole, so the mass of the upper region actually increases where the lower region is same. So essentially you have to join these two halves of this BTZ black hole, one with say the lower one says mass M and the upper one is mass M plus. You join it across the shock using these Israel conditions and so on. However, as I said that there is an alternate picture which was actually worked out by this Dreher and Thuf. which was like, you say that both above and below the shock, the geometry is the same BTZ, but now you apply the prescription whenever the trajectory crosses the shock, it suffers a shift in the Z direction. Okay. So you can write this geometry, this whole geometry in this way. We have a theta function at the V equal to zero. So below the, I mean, in the negative uh, V axis, it does not contribute this term. So you have the usual BTZ, but above this uh, V axis, I mean, this above, the shock, this theta function comes into play, and essentially the geometry is in the upper half is given by this. Okay. So yeah, now we can essentially do a simple coordinate transformation for this u. So here that means now if you look at this term, so we can now replace this term by this du prime minus this delta thing. Okay, so once you do that. You essentially get this HVV dv factor, dv square factor, which is essentially of this form like delta v here, delta x, and so on, which actually we derived here. Right. So this is indeed, I mean, this kind of geometry in which corresponds to a shock wave geometry, and you can visualize it in any way you want. To. Right. So let me summarize the effects. So for the v particle, you have got this. This is the stress tensor, and this results to this geometry. And for the W particle, this is like the source and this is the response, right? So now we have to compute this action, which was like something D, U, D, V, X, O, G. Right, so here you, you essentially multiply this with this and vice versa. Now you see, if you look at the products, so these are essentially, I mean, symmetric, for example, this has P1U, P2V, there's a like a delta V, delta U, and there's a product of delta function in X and F here. Similarly here, there's a P2V, P1U, delta V, delta U, and so on. So under the integral, the integral is now trivial because here you have a delta function in V, delta function in U, and delta function in X, so it's trivial. And uh, so essentially these two terms will add up in the computation and you get, uh, so this half actually goes away and let me write you the final result. The final result is, this actually comes from uh, this, Square root G. Sorry, I should write it. So, V naught, V, and this F of this one minus this two. Because one of the, uh, I mean, the under X integral, this X1 just, X just collapses to x1, so you put it, you get this. This result is nothing but r naught. This is my uh, Mandelstam variable this, and this is the impact parameter. Right. So this is my result for this phase shift. Right. Now here, I'll make one point. So let me comment on this string correction now. So here we roughly have this delta, which 
close as like G Newton times S. Okay. That is because we only consider this uh, graviton exchange track uh, near the horizon. Okay. If you allow for higher spin exchange, then it essentially becomes G Newton times S to the power J minus one. And we are working in the regime where this goes to infinity. So uh, now once you allow for higher spin, you cannot actually truncate. Okay. You have to consider the sum over the entire higher spin exchange. However, if you carry out this sum, I mean, there's a resummation possible. I actually don't know how it happened, but it happens that when you carry out the entire sum, the overall S dependence actually gets lower. It's no longer G Newton times S. Uh, so we, in the final formula, we'll see after we compute the result for gravity, we'll see that what happens when you actually lower this S dependence. Okay. That we'll see when uh, we work out uh, this thing. So that computes this part for this phase shift. Uh, now I will go back to the wave function, I mean the wave function thing. Okay. How much time am I left to? Half an hour actually, right? Half an hour, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now I go to this uh, wave function computation. So recall that my wave function was like a Since this, I, uh, I, this was like Fourier transform of some bulk to boundary propagators, right? Right. right. So now, uh, the Fourier trans, I mean the bulk to boundary propagator is simply given by this formula. The delta is the dimension of this operator W. So what is this cosh hyperbolic HD? So this is essentially the case of two comma two invariant distance between the point in the bulk and the boundary. Okay. The point where you are actually trying to and uh, this has a very nice compact form if you go to the uh, embedding coordinates of ADS3 because ultimately BTZ is nothing but a piece of uh, ADS, pure ADS3. And pure ADS3, if you write in terms of this, uh, uh, this embedding uh, coordinates, then the formula is so it's a prime minus x2, x2 prime. Suppose these two points are so t1, x1. T1, T2, X1, X2, and the other is like primes. Right. So, so you can actually convert this to in uh, the, this Kushkal coordinates. Okay. And if you do that, uh, if this embedding coordinates can be converted to Kushkal coordinates or VT coordinates, whatever. We are working in Kushkal coordinates. So, in Kushkal coordinates, it simply becomes some u to the power t. So this U V are for the X are for the position of the for the point in the bulb, and this actually comes from here. Is for example we are working with V equal to zero. For some cases we work with U equal to this different thing. This E to the power T things is essentially come from the boundary point because remember that near the boundary this actually goes to E to the power minus t or to the plus t. The R star actually goes to zero in the boundary. Okay, so this is your essential formula uh, for this uh, bulk to boundary propagator. And uh, then another thing is that here, actually we are assuming some you know, beta is equal to two pi, otherwise you have this factors of beta here. Okay, we'll restore it later. So once you get this uh, Fourier transform, uh, once you get this bulk to boundary propagator, you essentially have to do a Fourier transform here. Once you do that, 
Now, the expressions are a little scary. I mean, for generic delta and so on. I have just written the relevant pieces of my interest. Okay. So for example, here you can see, so first of all, there is some theta functions. A mathematical will do this. Uh, so there's some theta functions. And then there's this P, P pieces, which are required from a integral. And then there is this e to the power pieces. And this is also, the, it has a e to the power, e to the power kind of term. So these are my expression for uh, the four wave functions, the psi one, psi three, four, one, two. And, and we have also written this uh, phase shift delta in terms of uh, this PU and PV. We finally we have to do this in the integral. Okay. So with all this, now we want to perform the integral. Well, there are these pieces which are like P independent and they can essentially be re uh, removed by normalizing this OTOC in the following way. WT4 divided by WT1 WT2. So W, so it is three, is two, which is four. Right. Because this ultimately will give you that this product shy one star, shy two star, psi three, psi four and uh, into the power i s plus here you'll have one okay. so those pieces essentially drop out and another thing to note is that if your delta is actually constant or zero then this is exactly one so what's saying is that if the particles don't interact, then essentially this OT OC is like one and the system is like theory, but that's not uh, what we're doing. Okay. We have essentially uh, restored, I mean, we have essentially taken into account the back reaction, which makes this delta non-trivial. So that is the most important point of this entire exercise that you have to consider this back reaction at some point. This matter should interact at some point to each other through gravity or some higher spin, whatever. That essentially makes this OPOC uh, uh, non-trivial. Okay. So let's go to that computation, which is the final computation. So however, uh, so let, for timing now, I'll focus on this uh, normalized part. I mean, this. Okay. So see the form of this wave functions is such that it's, uh, as I said, it's a little, I mean, discouraging. So what we have to do is essentially have to do some variable redefinition to massage these forms. So what we do is as follows. So if you consider this object like psi one, psi three, psi one star, psi three, and p one u essentially comes in the integral. Yeah. So for example, this, these are essentially p u dependent integral. So we consider this, yeah. So it has got something like term, something like this. Now, what we do, we do this variable redefinition that is like simply setting this object to some P. Okay. Then it actually at least have a better, I mean, it looks at least better, yes. a little compact. Okay. Here, I mean, uh, due to this uh, coordinate redefinition, there will be some of these other factors which are P independent, for example, e to the word P, they essentially go out of the integral. We are not bothered with that. So, uh, we are now going to consider these pieces only. And similarly for the Q, essentially we'll do this kind of redefinition, which makes the rest part look like this. Okay. Now, but most importantly, when you substitute this redefinition in the phase shift formula, this becomes something like this. Okay. This exponential factor and all this. Also. So at this point, we have to fix this time parameters. Okay, to proceed further, and that's um, we do it in, as follows. So we set my t1 equal to some i epsilon 1, t2 equal to some t plus i epsilon 2, t3 equal to i epsilon 3. Okay, then this epsilon i is 
a roughly ordered beta and t is much much greater than beta which is db solution okay. however one thing i must say here that unlike suri i mean she was started with a euclidean picture so you have to have some ordering of these epsilons here it is not actually required we are throughout working in the lorentzian signature so whatever order you choose i mean there is no particular ordering like you have to choose this epsilon greater than something that is not required here okay that's one thing the other thing is that uh, now just by we we are free to since we are free to choose this epsilon we can essentially place our operators anywhere on the thermal circle okay that uh, will do at the end so when you re replace this answers in this uh, formula this something becomes something like that yeah so this becomes 2 pi g to p q so when 1 3 to spin p q star But this epsilon i j is defined in this way. So this is okay because uh, we have started. I mean, so even from get go, we have we are essentially working with the uh, out of time order thing. We are working in the Lorentzian signature throughout. Okay. So here the T's are Lorentzian. So in Lorentzian, there is a precise sense of time ordering. For example, we started with something like a T1, T2, T3, T4, and we chose that my T1 is equal to T3, T2 is equal to T4, and uh, but this T2 is much much greater than T1. Okay. So when we started from a out of time ordered thing, here we are just analytically continuing because if you see, if you set all these epsilons to zero. And essentially, this blows up. So this is just like a regulating, but at this point, we do not rely. We don't rely on this essential ordering of the epsilons, which will make this OTOC. I mean, this time order. Whatever. We are explicitly working in a Lorentzian signature, which is like time order from get go. Okay, does the answer? Right. So yeah, so now we are at our final hurdle. Now I essentially compute this integral, which at least looks a little better now. So p to the power delta b minus one. To, and then this phase spot g into the power is some pq okay so this is the final integral that we have to compute now if you try to solve this integral for generic delta v and delta w, it's probably, it's not possible to solve. So what one does, one assumes that one of these operators is actually much heavy compared to the other. So here we are like taking this heavy, heavy, light, light, light. For example, this w, even in solid picture, he essentially took this. So if you assume this, then the Q integral is dominated by the saddle. Q is equal to two delta W. Next is equal to opposite. So this is like saying that uh, in this picture, now we'll essentially consider the graviton due to the W particle only and not the other way. Around.
So now once you have done the saddle point thing, obviously you can do another saddle point that makes life easy, but that will be too restricted. But the good thing is that once we have done the saddle point for this Q and this X2 integral, now the remaining integral can be done exactly. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi, so uh, didn't we assume some heavy operator limit when we approximate, did the shock approximation? See, I essentially took the effect of both, right? So when you did this, we say that both of them actually, this leaves a, uh, a graviton which connects to it, this actually does this. Okay. So it's like both of them are actually interacting with each other's graviton. What I'm saying here is that we are now assuming that one of the operators is much heavy. Okay. So the back reaction due to that will be dominated over the other. So this is like essentially the uh, thing that I showed yesterday is like a propagation in shockwave background. This is essentially what I actually recovered is this propagation in the shock. So essentially one operator is heavy, the other just try to pass it. In some sense, this captures that picture. Well, I was thinking since we got various delta functions and so on in the metric, uh, we already had some kind of shock wave approximation. Yes, shock, I mean, okay, see what was, happen. okay, what initially happened is that like both were like, I mean, up to that point when we did this, we did not assume that there's any hierarchy between the operators. Okay. It's like both like emitting shock and both are like, however, we restricted our attention to a very limited region. So we did not draw these diagrams and all. So at this point, we're assuming like both are like emitting graviton and the other is coupling to it. But here at this point, we are saying that, okay, no, we'll just choose one operator to heavy. So this is like now taking this picture into account, like, it's propagating in a shockwave background. So essentially this will feel the effect of this and not the other way. That's so so is, the, is the statement that now I can put the internal uh, graviton line in a retarded correlator, is that the statement? Now the statement is like, I will take the graviton from one, I mean, not the other exchange. Yeah, but like, I mean, uh, I mean, it doesn't mean you're taking the internal, internal graviton to be in a retarded, the internal propagator to be retarded, is that the statement? Retarded as well. I mean, if it's time ordered, it's the same thing, right? W ka graviton or V ka graviton. I mean, the diagram looks the same, right? In the usual way. I mean, you don't separately consider those diagrams, right? Usually. Yeah, but see, the point is that uh, we are doing it essentially like on the t equal to zero slice. Okay. This particular interaction, we are restricting ourselves. Okay. So you are, I think, probably uh, getting confused. So in the original picture, this. This interaction is essentially happening in this t equal to zero slice. So on the slice, we're not talking about any particular ordering or out of time ordering. Okay. All I'm saying is that now uh, I'm just turning off the graviton due to other. That is nothing but, I mean, you can actually essentially do it for arbitrary delta V and delta Q. Okay. So, but uh, to do that in full glory, I mean, this is a simplification that we have to do. Otherwise, you cannot do the integral. I mean, that's all. It's just a mathematical simplification. But uh, what I'm saying is that under this mathematical simplification, now you can relate to that picture. Like it's a pro like this V particle is now propagating in a shock given by this W. Okay. So these two, this is actually a special case of, uh, I mean, up till that point, we're working with general operators and so on. Yeah, so the V particle sees some back reacted geometry, but the- W particle does not. Yeah, so yeah, that's what I mean. I guess that's that's probably equivalent to saying the the internal graviton is retarded with the vertex at the V at the later time. No, like uh, that's what I was trying to ask. Okay, I'll probably try to think over it because uh, okay. I, I mean, this picture is happening essentially at a constant T slice. It's all this. Okay. Hmm. So it's thanks. Yeah. Some other questions. Yeah, no, I'm just uh, trying to understand what he was asking. What he was asking that means, it, uh, are you uh, trying to ask means how do we classify whether a graviton is going from W to V or V to W? Is that why you are asking? That? Yeah, I, I thought he's saying the the graviton is going from W to V, hence hence that line that in that that uh, propagator is uh, retarded. I mean, in the sense that the V C is the back reacted late time back reacted geometry after W does its thing and modifies the geometry no, no, right? essentially it's not exactly that i mean in that uh, this so it was just calculation wise like what did that uh, what did that word mean like as in uh, the uh, v uh, or dc is the 
back reaction from wo not the other way that will be a, i mean i mean a hard statement to make because essentially as i said first thing is that the pollution happens for a very small instance of time and also i mean we are restricting to it i mean roughly on a constant time slice so for a constant time slice the sense of this uh, retarded in advance obviously i'm not quite sure about the statement but uh, maybe i mean in some sense you're saying it right i'm not getting you at this point uh, probably it could translate to that there are no closed loops in your diagram so i probably i think the fact that it will go from only one particle to another it may probably add that uh, all uh, i don't know sorry it's not not closed loop but yeah uh, Okay, probably. No, no, I'm not talking about any blue. Means, uh, I was just thinking that uh, when we are saying that uh, we are only allowing, um, say, W to V graviton transfer. Yes. Uh, in your means uh, integral, how do you see that it is only detailing that? Means how is it guaranteed? That's what I was thinking of. Okay, so the idea is that uh, let me go to the integral. Yeah, right. Uh, so you're asking how I drop one of these terms, right? Yeah, 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 right. Uh, let me see. Uh, see the. Uh, see. So the information of this heavy delta should. Come at one of these variables for sure. Okay, and then there will be something like okay, this is some approximation that we essentially can do again. So this, so these terms, I think this H and this uh, T, this has already got a G Newton, and then there will be some delta, some information of delta will surely come. Okay, so then you restrict yourself to a limit where you take this G Newton delta to be. Considerable or negligible. Okay, okay, okay. Um, That's how you drop this uh, one of the terms. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, right now, uh, essentially, after this thing, you can now do this p and this x integral. However, okay, p integral you can do exactly. I mean, uh, but the x integral for the, to do the x integral, you again have to assume that your delta p is large. It's smaller than delta w. So essentially, we're working in a regime where this is going to be okay. This is very similar to what we did this heavy, heavy, light, light uh, in this thing. Okay. So with after all this thing, so finally we write down this end result. This is exactly what she wrote in her computation. Okay. So, yes, equal to the power delta v. But this delta v is large. Right. So now you can essentially. Uh, just squeeze in this G Newton dependence here, it will be something like a T minus T star minus mod of X1 minus X2. And then there's a delta W sitting outside. Okay. So now if you assume that this quantity is less than one, that is like, first of all, you have to assume that you're working in this, well, not just this, this time is also there, but had space been not there, this was like you are, you assume that u t is much much less than this t star. So if you assume that you work in a regime where this object is still small, so now we can binomial expand, and that leads to our final desired result. To the power. Now I'm restoring this t dependence. Right. 
So this essentially shows that your parameters are just all typed. And here, as you see that, I mean, we have to smear this on the thermal circle, otherwise this will diverge. Okay, but this you can do however you wish to do. So now one thing about this computation is that uh, to get this result, one key aspect was this delta scales as this linearly with this, okay. Because I mean, if we go through this change of variable and whatever this, uh, so uh, this delta is there. Delta depends on s means it depends on uh, this p times q. Okay, and then here, you, for example, you do this, which actually pulls out this e to the power t. Okay. So this linear in s behavior is actually crucial to get uh, this exponential behavior. Now, as I was saying about this uh, stringy correction, so stringy correction, this goes like uh, one minus t minus two minus one. So this would have been something like this one minus this. Okay. So now, if you pull out this e to the power t, so clearly you can see that it would have resulted in something like. A, Minus one. So lambda, sorry, this is just one minus this times. Okay, so essentially your lambda will be lowered from two pi over beta, and it respects the bound. What I don't know of is like, uh, so this higher spin that Shilvi was talking, uh, whether there is some kind of resummation that exists there, which essentially respects this bound, that I don't know. But here it happens that the stringy correction essentially lowers this bound. Okay. That is like increasing this uh, T star, which is now like a beta log GM. Plus So your T star essentially increase. And this is also expected because this alpha prime correction essentially boils down to a one over two coupling correction in the field theory, right? So in some sense, you are essentially lowering the strength of your coupling. So your system is bound to be lesser chaotic. Hence the framing type increases. Okay. So this roughly ends this uh, discussion on this scattering and all this bound in this picture. Okay, so I'll pause here if there is some question or discussion. Okay, if not, uh, then, uh, okay, so maybe I'll take five more minutes. So this was essentially like one of the picture of chaos that we show, like uh, this bulk scattering. However, this has a serious limitation, like uh, this is very hard to do for d greater than three and with charges like this q and g. In three dimensions, it's probably still possible, but not hard. For example, finding this wave function analytically is uh, very difficult there, and also this phase shift computation and all. Okay, yeah, I have a question. So, so actually, all the existing results are all are all three and two dimensional, is it? Sorry. So this is CFT three or is it uh, ADS three? You mean ADS three, right? Yeah, I mean ADS three. I mean, and so, so, so the all the all the reported calculations are all in three D. Is it like are there no higher dimensional uh, calculations? All scattering. Ha! Huh, yeah, the calculating the Laplace exponent. I actually I only know this in three dimension. I mean, at least in three dimension with rotation, there is some computation uh, by Victor Janke and this 
Jodi probably, yeah. Otherwise, higher than three dimension, I actually don't know if any such computation exists. Maybe Shubham can tell on this. Maybe any thoughts? The light is dark. So, so far, so, whatever you have said, uh, this seems to be generalized, right? I mean, uh, yeah, so the far problem is to do this analytically. I mean, you have to compute these wave functions and all. I mean, okay, ultimately, the wave functions do not see. Ultimately, in this formula, the wave functions part is like uh, the, the main part actually comes from this phase thing, e to the power i delta s. Okay, this is like the heart of the computation, as I said. Okay, but still, there is some we have to get to this. I mean, we essentially did some. Uh, coordinate transformation. I mean, some. So I mean, not coordinate transformation. Normal variable redetermination, which is actually governed by these wave functions. Okay, so they play a passive role here. I mean, for higher dimension, finding this bulk to boundary propagator and then Fourier transforming it, and then I think this analytic expression of this size is actually very hard to get. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. But the exchange graviton is still some low energy, small frequency graviton, right? Yeah, that is the only, I mean, this, I mean, what should I say? This is the. And, uh, yeah, Miss, can I say something? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so for uh, BTC, we know the full retarded Green's function. We know the full form of this retarded Green's function in BTC, in case of BTC. But uh, for RN kind of means for higher dimension, uh, can we solve analytically? Yeah, as I'm saying, I mean, I don't know because. Uh, this wave function computation is totally, I mean, even you know that. Mm. Means in BTZ, uh, means we know that uh, we, we have people solve this full form of this. Uh, button. Mean, I'm actually not keep track of it because now in the second panel, they do another thing which actually gets rid of all these complications. Okay. So as mm. I was rightly saying that this universal piece is like this graviton exchange thing. So this is the thing that we now try to we'll focus on this for the so, yeah, so what I was trying to ask is like if it's a low frequency graviton exchange, some I mean something could probably even set by doing some derivative expansion or something, right? Yeah, that can be done. I mean I mean the propagators can be definitely constructed in derivative expansion. Yeah. Uh, so for the shock, I, I don't know, but like if just yeah, the graviton I mean, exchange, probably. Yeah, I mean, it's actually subtle. Like, you know, finding the shock wave geometry is a dimension. I don't know, actually. I'm not. No, I'm asking, do you really need to calculate the shock wave geometry? I mean, is it you, you can you or can you just extract it from just from the Fourier space expressions or something? Because all these, these calculations are typically done in this position basis and so on, but is that. Uh, in position basis, I mean, aren't we doing it in the? No, no, for instance, no. we are in do, uh, when when I say position basis, I mean time. Like yeah. Okay, I mean uh, time is like the boundary in the bulk. We are essentially doing it on momentum and uh, like a longitudinal momentum and transverse position. Yeah. So position is like space. This transverse space X is hanging around. In yeah, that 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 part is okay. But I'm saying, I so like, the, yes, has I anyone done this in like frequency as well? of this Green's function, then probably we can uh, try to do this, right? Yeah, that is a uh, one statement. Yeah, maybe that's possible. That I mean, you should be if you try to do this in the frequency yeah. domain, and then like there should be some residue or something you should look at and get the Laplanoix point, right? Like, I uh, do you know if anyone has done that, done it that way? I actually don't know. I mean, uh, this is actually uh, fairly old. I mean, okay, roughly now I say that we can officially say that it's a little old subject, but I don't know if anyone has done it in that way. I mean, people, I mean, so essentially now I'm going to say something which actually came around this uh, 2007, uh, 2016 or 17. And people actually got in, more interested into that because that is like more universal compared to this. Okay. So, that can is that holds for any dimensions. The next part that I'm going to talk about. Are you talking about the hydrodynamic thing? Or? No, not the hydrodynamic, the Schwarzian thing. I mean, this uh, Schwarzian description is essentially depends on a near horizon ADS2 region, which holds for black holes in any dimensions. Okay. 
but that you really need to do the charge case, right? Like, is there a version for the short shell black hole? Sorry, what charge? Oh, yeah, you're saying that, okay, extreme, okay. Right, I mean, so, yeah, you need to have charge, but uh, so I'll tell you what happens if and if you don't have, I mean, for example, for BTZ, okay, the extremal limit is actually too trivial. Yeah, in some sense, right, you need charge, that is true. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, it doesn't matter because anyhow, at strict extremality, we will not be able to do in some sense, we have to go away from extremality. I mean, we have to break the extremality at some point. So it doesn't matter in that case, it doesn't matter if you have a charge or not. Okay, so exact zero temperature is difficult. But once you have a small temperature, it doesn't matter if you have a charge or not. Okay. So I'll tell you that. But yeah, that is true okay. for charge and charge. It's near, okay, this actually called this near ADS2, which is the near horizon region for a near extremal black hole. And for near extremal, I think you can do it for BTZ as well. You do not need a rotating BTZ. As long as you have a small temperature, uh, I mean, the mass, that's enough. Oh, hello? Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I means in your uh, you are going going to speak about this pool skipping phenomena also, right? In your future lectures. That is a. I'm not sure. If yeah, yeah. So people have done this gravitational perturbation, and they said like this. Uh, this Einstein's equation, some component of this Einstein's equation vanishes at some modes, and they have compared those modes to this Lapinov exponent like that. So, I think. In that way, for higher dimension also, you can uh, means extract this Lapinov exponent. So Kowalski is actually uh, exclusively for 2D safety. I mean, I don't know it for higher dimension safety. So any comments about higher dimension is little non-trivial. They have done this near horizon expansion just. Yeah, near horizon expansion, yeah. So what Kowalski essentially says that your Green's function becomes, uh, I mean, ill-defined. Uh -huh. so like, uh, near the horizon, you now only have at certain frequencies. Hmm. In uh, this in you cannot actually distinguish between an ingoing and outgoing mode. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, so at those particular frequencies, if you are like uh, analytically continue, you get the Lyapunov exponent. So, but that is a yeah, statement. Yeah. Is, I mean, the field theory is a statement only at the level of two D safety. I don't know if, if it exists as a statement for higher dimension safety. Or, it perhaps it exists in a uh, black holes in. Mm -hmm. dimension, but uh, I'm going to discuss the field theory aspects. So there is what we see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, that's again the statement you need excel results to see that, right? Sorry, can you come again? No, I'm just saying like it's again the statement that you need exact results to see this pole skipping too, right? Like you need to. Yes, sorry, I'm not doing it. You need sorry. the exact propagator to see the pole being yeah, pole that, getting skipped. Yeah, that is like a stress tensor. I mean, as I said, I'll do it. Yeah. In uh, so, no, I was just commenting that. At the boundary. That, that, no, no, I, I, I think I am just commenting that like to see that pole skipping and so on. Like you need exact results. For the bulk to bar, the boundary propagator, right? Oh, no, so no, that no. you can. That is completely in boundary. I mean, pole to I mean, pole skipping is something like you compute the retarded Green's function of the stress tensor in a two D CFT, and you see where these poles and the zeros they overlap. Okay, oh, okay. That... I was I was referring to the bulk calculation again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that again, you you get to see only in ADS three because there you can do exact calculations. Yeah. Yeah. So pole skipping is again exclusive to 2D CFT. I mean, the near horizon uh, argument that she was talking about, that probably can be generalized. But uh, actually, people started, I mean, the pole skipping idea started from this stress tensor two point function, but people have generalized it for everything, like scalar, vector, and everything. Okay. Mm. So, for in, so in that context, it can be generalized to higher dimension probably. But uh, mm -hmm. let's talk about the boundary origin that I'll talk about again. Yeah, so people have means uh, compared this Lapinov exponent by doing this gravitational perturbation. This pole skipping points to Lapinov exponent. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Mm. That's, that's what I was okay, so I'm okay. I'm actually not quite comfortable in committing on higher dimensions because I will mostly work in three and 
to. Some of the features, okay, at least the next, this Georgian thing, that, that can surely, that has a universal appeal that we shall discuss tomorrow. But uh, otherwise, the shockwave computation and the school skipping, I like to talk it only in the, the KDS 3C. So what are you planning to do next, like right now? Okay, so next what I plan to do is as follows. Or are you uh, just confirming? So we, uh, like, can I have a, ask a slightly tangential doubt, like? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, so, I don't think I'll push it further today. But okay, yeah. So so we, we have been kind of saying uh, uh, that the bulk calculation kind of dominates around the near horizon region, right, so far? In yes. This, Yes. Uh, so, uh, how, what is the? Uh, how should I say that from the boundary? Like, oh, that is like it's nothing but saying like your chaos. Ultimately, I mean, here we are explicitly talking about late time chaos. Okay. So, as I said, that there's two notions of early time versus late time chaos. I'm not actually. Uh, I mean, this early time chaos things comes when you're talking about uh, connections with hydrodynamics because then it's like. The people try tries to find a relation between some early time Lyapunov behavior and some late time diffusion and so on. I'm not talking about that. So in whatever me and Suvi has discussed, that is essentially late time chaos in the boundary. Okay. So now late time physics in the boundary is like near horizon physics. Okay. So hence the dominant contribution always comes. No, I'm I'm trying to get a bit more specifics on like how do you say that statement like late time physics is near horizon. Okay. So oh, that is simply this UVIA correspondence. May, may, maybe, okay, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm pushing you to say more, some, some bit more elaborately because like uh, naively, like uh, oh, okay. naively, naively you would say the the late, the chaos exponent is a property of the uh, of the energy level statistics where the level spacing goes to become small, right? Yeah, because I'm it shows that, it. Okay, so if you're, I'm not sure about the question, I mean, what are you trying to- Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to face my question, sorry. Uh, so I'm saying like the, this Lapinov experiment being some late time effect, like probably corresponds to some level uh, effect when the, when the energy level spacing is kind of small, right? Like similar to how Pranjal discussed about uh, the plate two and so on. Yes. Uh, so, like, it's some property of the, and hence it's from some property of the probably some uh, level spacing when the energy states themselves are very high, but the level spacing kind of goes to zero or something. Yeah. And 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 naively, like uh, this UVIR thing says, uh, at least the way I I I I I understood it, like naively says, so oh, towards the boundary you have high energy states, towards the bulk you have low energy states. Right. Well, I'm not sure. What I'm saying is that so late time here. So this, you surely know this. This is like an RG flow from this horizon to the boundary. Right. right. So, so it 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 only really talks about the uh, like the size. It say, says about the abs, kind of uh, refers to the absolute size uh, energy in the state. Right. Like uh, is it a high energy state, low energy state kind of state? What did you mean by that? You, all I'm sorry, saying is what that what you mean by in the boundary is always captured by near horizon physics. That's it. That's always true. The late time physics in the boundary will be captured by your near horizon. Physics. Yeah. So, so I'm trying to ask. I'm trying to ask. Should I should when this UVIR thing this does it also imply that the low low horizon close to horizon physics really captures the small level spacing physics of the boundary? Is that the right conclusion from this or? In terms of spacing, I'm not sure. I mean, I mean, late time physics I understand. So that late time physics is probably the small level space low small. Like adjacent energy level physics, right? Yes. I, yeah. So, can... so is that is that a more a more precise statement of I this UVIR? Seen, I have not seen. Uh, okay, I have actually. It may be. I mean, I know the statement that is said. It may be what you're saying is true, but I actually don't know. Yeah, I'm, bec I'm. I'm just. I'm just triggered because of the way the chaos chaos thing works, right? Like, I'm, I was just asking, like, how people. Yeah. Have you seen this statement made like this? Or no, actually, have you thought about this statement like this? You can put it on Slack. I mean, someone can answer this better. I actually haven't seen this statement. Okay, thanks. 
Oh, what what was it meant by that uh, UV modes or like high energy modes live near the boundary and uh, like low energy modes live in the bulk? That's, that's, uh, what was the statement? Of the so you're asking me or Akhil? Yeah, Akhil made this statement. No? So, I, I, I thought the UV IR statement was that, right? The physics of the closer to the boundary is like the physics of some really UV states. For example, you put counter terms by just looking at asymptotic. Of the boundary means it's like there are like two boundaries. Like is in case of ADS, there's an asymptotic boundary. And the, the lower uh, when I say the boundary, I mean asymptotic boundary. Yeah, the so asymptotic boundary that is the large distance. That would be like the large distance uh, thing, right? So it should be the low low energy mode should. No, no, no. Asymptotic boundary is like the last. Yeah, exactly. What that's why I we called it UVIR. So asymptotic boundary seems like last distance from the bulk. So large distance, then then there should be low energy modes, which should be. Uh -huh, but in the in the in the CFT, the uh, uh, things which happen at the boundary of the ADS is like some high energy phenomena in the CFT. That's why it's called yeah, UVIR. That's so essentially, suppose this is a horizon. This is your boundary. So this is like the UV of the bulk, but this is the IR of the boundary. This region and the other way. Okay. Yeah, just to clarify, like the statement sounds like it's like yeah, just yeah, stated yeah. in the second statement that you are making. Uh, to be honest, I have not seen this or heard this, so um, uh, I should not comment. But maybe yeah, I was just asking is that a more a more precise takeaway of UVIR statement, but from this chaos, like yeah, okay. So oh, one thing may be true that means when uh, like in, in case of a black hole, I think means within a given a energy level spacing, you have more available number of microstates. So effectively, probably what you are thinking is true that. Uh, yeah, that's you know, interesting. That's right, but uh, yeah, I'm not. That's why probably this quantum chaos shows up, but I, I'm I, I'm not sure about any details. I just like uh, hand waving. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm just saying I'm, I'm I'm mostly motivated from how the scales thing works here. Yeah. Okay, yeah, you better post on Slack. I mean, they're the front and back. I wish they can try to reply. I I wish Shovik was here. They could probably yeah. Okay. Maybe we can stop the recording now. Yeah, I think there's no more questions. So let's thank.